news. Play breakdowns. Power rankings. Storylines you never hear talked about. Anywhere else. It's all straight shots here. Fired by straight shooters. S and gun. This is the Objective Basketball Podcast. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Objective Basketball Podcast. Welcome back to the people who may have been listening last season. We are joined here today by uh, someone who I think will be perfect for this segment of the podcast. A good way to sort of start off this this NBA season, just because I think the Eastern Conference title race, the Western Conference title race, which we'll get to in a bit, the NBA title race in general is wide open. I think there are a lot of teams that can go after it right now. Obviously, there are the top dogs, the guys that have really shaked things up right right this summer uh and it's been awesome to kind of watch things kind of transpire in the preseason if you will last night we saw something transpire for the first time and that's why we are joined by ty windish he is a milwaukee bucks coverer coverer of the milwaukee bucks uh on the euro step i like to say the gyro step it's all good though you know I'm, i like to throw a little bit of uh of greek in there uh you're obviously a network manager over at blue wire pods as well ty my guy, I haven't had you on the pod yet, but we have interacted a bunch on Twitter. How are you doing? I'm doing great. And I want to restate my official position is if you pronounce Euro, frankly, better than right. I do or can, that's okay if that's how you refer to the show. <laughs> I don't mind. You don't you don't pronounce it to look it up, right? Like if You're you right. type it in and find it, if you want to say, I'm not even gonna try, I, I can't I can't roll ours, I can't do any of the fun pronunciations at all. I've always said there's no, you know, you say whatever you want, man. If you're listening, yeah. if you're p- typing it in, that's good with me. So appreciate you having me. Excited to talk Eastern Conference and, and Bucks. Certainly today of all days, you know, uh little like not not 24 hours from seeing freaky time we're still bucks twitter's <laughs> debating what the nickname's gonna be there's a freaky time versus freak time versus oakland euros there's a lot going on but um okay. we got to finally see it and very excited at the moment if i had to if i had a horse in this situation i would say freak time i think freak okay. time just it, it kind of it makes sense freaky time is too out there you know you're going too far <laughs> into the deep end i just feel like let's pull yeah. it back Anyways, you're right. Uh, I appreciate you com- coming on the podcast. It should be fun. We're, this is episode one for a lot of people who are listening to this for the opening of the season um, with the Milwaukee Bucks, right? And I think that's where this Eastern Conference title race starts, depending on who you talk to. Some people will say Boston. Some people will say Milwaukee. And we will go back and forth on this throughout this 82-game regular season. But we've got you here. And obviously, Damian Lillard and Giannis Antetokounmpo, we saw them for the first time last night against the Los Angeles Lakers. Your thoughts just immediately, game one, seeing those two together, and maybe how the rest of the team has has sort of coalesced in this short amount of time. Yeah, you can tell they're not they're not totally used to it yet, right? I mean, I think it is a big adjustment. I mean, Giannis talked about, he said that's the most open I've been in five to seven years you know, as they played 15 minutes together, it's not like yeah. there was a ton of time, but he could feel it right away. And I think they, they overpassed some possessions. I think they missed Dame on some other possessions, but I think you could see right away that the excitement we had over this partnership, in addition to whenever you can add a great player you want to, right? I mean, a Damian Lillard level guy, you'd always want to add, but him versus a different player, you know, who maybe isn't this doesn't have the same skill set. Dame was perfect. Dame was one of the two players, Bucks fans and and prognosticators always wanted to coverers, as to use your term, always wanted to see (laughs) with Giannis because it's like you want that spacing, that threat. I, I mean, I would say not just talent wise, but fit wise and just the way the game is played now. I don't know if we've ever seen a combination of two players like this. And I'm not saying they're better than Steph and Katie or whatever else you want to say, but just the dominant paint threat roller with the spacing out to you know with dame what like 40 feet like however far back you want to go yeah. i mean it's only dame and steph who really are, are doing that consistently at that level and of course Giannis is kind of one of one of how he plays too so the gravity is real i mean there was so much open space around those two guys and their actions and i love that you could tell dame and the bucks and dame has said this a bunch but of course you've got to see it to know for sure you know, it's not like, okay, they're going to run 50 Damianis pick and rolls a game. I think crunch time, we're going to see a lot of them, but it's using the gravity and weaponizing it. And like, okay, Dame hands off to Malik Beasley, flares to the corner, and now there's another action. And it's just such a, a layered offense. And you can tell they're like, 
how can we just break defenses without needing Dame to take all the shots? And I think that's right. going to be able to help him, you know, kind of stay healthy, stay good, be fresh for the playoffs. And it's just going to make a better offense. You know, I, I love the beautiful game kind of offensive sets. And I'm not saying the Bucs are going to look like the 14 Spurs, but I am saying it looks like the ball is going to move. People are going to move. And it's not just going to be constantly Dame and Giannis, although, of course, they're the straws that stir the drink, but man, they, they're syncing together really well. It seems like they're clicking off the court. They're my new favorite NBA bromance, the way they talk about each other. Um, <laughs> and it looks like they're going to be dominant playing together, especially offensively. Um, the, the pairing looks terrific so far, even though it was just 15 kind of choppy minutes. So the Milwaukee Bucks, yes, last year were 22nd in half court offense. I don't think that will be the case this season <laughs> at all, just because yeah. of the fact. I mean, they averaged, what was it, 86.3 points per 100 possessions last year as a half-court offense. That is uh, pretty bad for a team that yeah. has championship aspirations. They got away with it in their championship season just because they were dominant as a transition team, killing teams in fast-break opportunities, forcing turnovers, et cetera, et cetera. And I think they'll still be able to tap into some of that. They still have the talent to be able to do that, but they now have the ability to be sustainable as a half court offense, the pull up shooting of Damian Lillard, like you mentioned, that two man game is just going to open up so much for, more for him. It was funny for Giannis to say he's never been this open before because I feel like Chris Middleton is getting shafted in this situation. <laughs> and this is this is actually sort of the second part of this is obviously um, the questions about Middleton's health. I know Adrian Griffin kind of went back and forth with the media in preseason. Yeah. That was a very interesting quote. I'm not sure what that was all about. He definitely no needs knows. a little bit of, uh, he still needs that media training, you know, yeah. Bucks, Bucks PR got to get him going on that. But where are you at with Middleton? What can we potentially expect from him this season? And ultimately he plays a huge part of this team's championship aspirations. I, I just like, can you rely on him being that third guy, knowing some of the injury concerns that we've seen from last season and maybe even coming into this year? Yeah, it's funny, the Chris getting shafted thing. It, it is funny how out of their way, Chris, Dame, and Giannis have all been to kind of be deferential to each other. Everything right. we hear from those guys is awesome. So I know you didn't ask about it, but if anyone is like, oh, is there going to be a culture problem in Milwaukee? I, I don't think so. I think they're going to okay. win enough that there wouldn't be anyway, but I, I don't think there's going to be any anything like that going on. They're, they're lucky. I mean, they've assembled a great group that, that gets along. But winning, injury-wise, winning solves everything. That, that's also true. And you that's know? also true. And and they haven't won less than 50, um, you know, adjusting for shorter seasons, a winning yeah. percentage that would get you there. The whole Bud tenure, which was five straight years. So yeah, it's kind of hard. I mean, if you do have chemistry issues and you're winning that much, then you really got something bad going on. But yeah. uh, in terms of Chris health wise, you know, I think he was clearly not 100% last year. He was recovering from the, the knee issue and, and just kept having that soreness with it and fought his way back. And I will say, you know, I read a lot like, oh, the last time we saw Chris, he was a 14 point per game player. And is that going to be enough for them? In the Miami series, he was a 26 and six player on good efficiency. Like when they really needed him, he stepped up and he was still very effective. He wasn't as good defensively. Chris's defense was not their biggest issue in that series, not even right. close. There was a lot that went wrong. We don't have time on this show to dive in. <laughs> Thankfully, the Bucks have Dame now, so I don't have to think about it as much anymore right. anyway. Um, but I, I think I think he's going to be good enough. And I think I'm, I'm encouraged by the, the offseason news. So for anyone not tuned in totally to the Bucks, he got the knee cleaned up soon after the year ended. And the reason he has not played yet, everything we've heard from the Bucks and from Chris himself in interviews, it's not any sort of issue or setback. They are just progressing him slowly. So he's done five on five. He says he he said he would try to play multiple preseason games. There's only two left. I'm guessing we're only going to see one. But John the plan Horse, has been John Horse yesterday said he expects him to play in the preseason at least multiple times again. So I don't know if yeah. like. I don't know if that's so something. maybe he'll play both Tuesday right. and Friday, you know, yeah. this, this week. Well, we'll see. I'll, I'll be I'll settle for one if he looks good. But I'm encouraged the fact that, you know, last year he was ramping up earlier in the season. Then he was actually able to play and kind of came back and got hurt again. There was all these setbacks. He says he feels great. He says there's been no like it's not like, oh, I have to settle down. I have to ramp back down. They're right. really just trying to be cautious and not overdo it with him. So, you know, I think there's Bucks fans that are still scarred by his injury, Brooks Lopez's injury the year before that, and that are just really concerned. I think he's going to be good to go. Um, I think he's going to be good enough, even if they have to be careful with him in the regular season. Um, you know, anything could happen. He's had, you know, kind of freak injuries before. But, I, I mean, there's no reason to, I think, automatically believe he won't be ready to, to help them win. This team, regular season-wise, should be enough to bring Middleton along slowly. Yeah. I mean, when you have the... 
the dynamism of Giannis and Dame together, you're going to be able to kind of coast along some of these weeks when you're playing the the Charlottes of the world, the Portland Trailblazers of the world, right? You're going to be able to sort of have these stints throughout the season where you're you're going to be able to find rest for some of these guys. Now, maybe the player participation thing sort of changes that. It, it adds a new yeah. dynamic. We'll see what the Bucks end up doing. Obviously, all three of those guys will be impacted by that. Um, but I ultimately think there is a way for them to bring along this team a little bit slower, uh, sort of like how they did in that championship season. Um, I, you obviously know more than most, but they were dominant as a regular season club for the first two seasons of that bud tenure. And then in that third season, the championship season, they kind of, they, they experimented a lot more. They tried out certain things, especially on defense to maybe just see what else they have. And it worked out in the playoffs. They, they looked way better in the playoffs because of it. Curious to see how you think of the, the rest of the guys. We talked about gravity, right? And just Damon Giannis, the ability for them to draw help. I mean, we saw it even, even in the 15 minutes yesterday, just their ability to op- create open shots for guys like Malik Beasley, guys like Jay Crowder, guys like Brooke Lopez. Um, the depth issue is something that pops up who they're going to be able to get contributions from throughout the rest of the season. And I think that plays a pack factor when you talk about rest right, is, hey, can Marjan Beauchamp come in and maybe give you like 20 minutes a night, you know, is, it, are we going to get Green or Jackson, and you know what I mean, like, there's, there's these different guys that might be able to jump into the rotation, and I'm kind of curious to see where you're at with the fringe, maybe end of playoff rotation guys in a Malik Beasley, in a Beauchamp, like, do you think that makes sense for them, is that a viable source for them going forward, or is this team maybe a team that is going to make another move in the middle of the season, maybe potentially at the trade deadline? Where do you kind of feel the Bucks might do or how they look depth-wise? Yeah, I mean, I think it would be rare for them to not make a move. I mean, John Horst is just exceedingly aggressive. I think it's a strength of his, um, but it, you know, they, they usually do. So I would think things would have to pan out extraordinarily well for them to not make a move, right? Like these young guys would have to really look clearly ready and the guys like Beasley and Crowder would have to be healthy and perfect fits. They're in on Beasley. I mean, the team is excited. The way they talk about him, I think he's stamped to be that fifth starter. They're really challenging him defensively. Of course, people are aware he's not a defensive. I mean, your reaction right now. Yeah, I, um, I, I'm not, I'm not, the, I, that, that makes me worried. I'm not gonna lie. I, I get bit. that. Yeah. And I, I think, I think to be clear, my read on it is not that they think he's, you know, suddenly a great defender. It's that they know with what he can do offensively with his own spacing. And I don't even know if he'll have gravity on this team. It's like, you know, the moon has gravity, but compared to the earth, it doesn't matter, right? Like that's, I think that's where Malik Beasley's at, but just his shooting itself. I mean, Malik Beasley getting wide open looks is going to be, is going to be great for him. I'm pretty sure. Right. Um, and I think it's like, you know what, Malik, just do enough defensively, like challenge him defensively because you know what the offense is and then you just get enough out of it. So I think he'll start the year as the fifth starter. I think someone would have to earn it or they'd have to make a trade for it to be somebody else. But certainly, I mean, could you go bigger with a Jay Crowder, who's, you know, a better defender, if not a quicker one? And I do think that's why it's Beasley to start. He's just quick enough, even if he's not a great defender. And you just need someone faster if you don't want Dame guarding every dynamic small guard. I don't well, think they do. What about Pat? What about Con? Pat's not really that quick either. I think Pat's right. a good situational defender. I Listen, I think, I think Pat will be the closer. I think okay. Pat is more likely to close. I think he's a more solid team defender, although Beasley has looked okay so far. Very small sample. I'm not saying – I'm not going to yeah. get on my Bucks copium and say he's like a great defender now. He's he's done well. He's clearly – I mean, the other thing is, like, you couldn't get a more incentivized player given where he's been That's in the true. past and, and the contract he's on now and everything else. So I think they have kind of a – not that Bruce Brown was a similar player, but that same situation of, like, big proven opportunity to to go, you know, change your future fortunes for Malik Beasley. I think Pat is going to be the closer. Um, I think they want someone to just run around screens more and stuff. And I don't know if Pat's ideal with that either. I think Marjan is the closest in terms of player type. I think at the moment, he's just a little too inconsistent, a little too up and down. The highs are super high. Like the highs of Marjan, it's like if he's that, if he was close to that 80% of the time, I think, yeah, he's probably the starter. He's just not there yet. I think especially, you know, he'll have those moments that just offensively he hesitates and it can come up the offense. And that's really just what you can't have with Damon Giannis and those guys, right? So I think they like Beasley because quick trigger knows what to do. Uh, I don't think anyone else would factor in as a starter. Andre Jackson going to be fun to watch him play. I think he's defensively, he might earn a role on this team just from being a good enough defender. And Adrian Griffin has shouted out his love of defense. 
right. I think you've got the top nine pretty clear in the projected starters with Beasley, obviously, you know, Chris Dame, Giannis, Brooke. I think campaign will play a lot to start just as the backup point guard. And then, of course, Pat Connaughton is going to play a lot. Bobby Portis as your backup big and then Crowder. So I think it's the young guys kind of fighting for that 10th spot. We'll see how many Adrian Griffin plays. I would guess they're not going to be as aggressive with minutes as he was with Nick Nurse in Toronto. Uh, we will see. But I think the Bucks, where they're at, I think, you know, how they've operated as a franchise. I'd be pretty surprised if Giannis was logging 36 minutes in the regular season this year. I actually looked at it. Dame could have the lowest minutes per game of his career and still lead the Bucks <laughs> in minutes per game this year. And I think that's probably going to happen, to be that's, honest. That's actually just mind-blowing, the fact that he said that. Um, Malik Beasley, okay, last year had a down shooting season. He was 35 yeah. 36%. Uh, in the playoffs for the Lakers, he was pretty much unplayable because of that. And the defense was a big factor in that as well. But he has had shoot, shooting seasons where he was a 40% shooter, 38% shooter, 39, 40 plus percent shooter. Uh, and if they can get that, that's obviously going to be huge for them. The big question I think is like, you know, if you're looking for a guy who can be able to guard these bigger wings, and we'll talk about the Celtics right now, kind of transitioning into what they might look like, what a series might look like between them and the Celtics. The main question is going to be how can the Bucks guard Jason Tatum? How can the Bucks guard Jalen Brown? And that's where you see you need to get something from Jay Crowder. He needs oh, yeah. to be the guy who looks like he did in that finals run for the Suns. Um, how they're able to manufacture that, how he looks. Maybe it's actually managing his minutes a little bit more too, so he's more fresh in the playoffs. But ultimately, that's like the big question that comes to mind when you think of the Bucks: is how are they going to be able to defend these wing-type players come playoff time? Um, let's transition to the Celtics since we're talking about wing-plus players. Um, obviously, they traded for Drew Holiday. You are an experienced Drew Holiday uh, advocate. I'm not even sure what this would be, but obviously you experienced the Drew Holiday experience for quite some time. You saw him win an NBA championship with your team. Uh, I thought, in my opinion, and you can talk to me about this because this is from a Bucks perspective. Uh, yes, he's had his inconsistencies as a playoff shooter, creator, efficiency-wise. But I think a lot of those things will go away slotting into Boston because he's not being asked to play the same offensive role that he was in Milwaukee. Would you agree with that statement? Or do you think maybe I'm I'm chewing too much, biting off too much to chew? Um, I, you know, I think it'll probably be somewhere in the middle. You know, I really do think um, part of the reason he was so involved in Milwaukee is just, you know, he's literally, as of this past year, an all-star point guard. And I, and I do think, you know, even though the, obviously the Jays and, and you know, Porzingis and I guess Derek White are going to provide a lot of offense, I mean, I would imagine that Drew Holiday is going to have the ball and is going to have kind of those fluctuations that, that Bucks fans are used to. I mean, I think it was probably worse, like in the, in some of the series, especially like against Boston with Chris out. Um, although, of course, Drew has always had some amazing defensive moments, but you know, there were series when Chris and, and Giannis and Drew were all playing and Chris and Giannis, you know, use a lot of possessions too. It's not like those guys are second fiddles to, to Drew or in the way the Bucks are built. Yeah. Um, and I think just, you'd see just some, some shot selection that is, it is curious. And, you know, I, all the Bucks fans are convinced he's going to shoot 40% from three in the playoffs. Cause that's just what tends to happen when players come and go from the Bucks, those percentages change. And we're all still <laughs> not sure why we're all, I think, Little panicked, you know, is Dame going to shoot 28% in a playoff run? I shouldn't have even said that out loud. Is that a double jinx? I don't know. I hope I hope it, uh, listen, I hope it jinxes the jinx. It's going to be pretty hard to jinx, jinx uh, Dame yeah, in the playoffs. Yeah, you would sure hope so. Yeah, you would sure yeah. hope so. Yeah. But I think, um, you know, defensively for what they lost in Marcus Smart, and I know, you know, uh, there was some agitation over Drew Holiday being ranked as a better defender in the GM survey. I mean, I think before all this stuff happened, I think it was kind of apparent Marcus Smart had stepped back a little bit in that in that era, and I think Drew is a much better defender at this point in their careers. Maybe Smart had a bad year. And I would agree. Wrong, I, I would agree but, that like at their at this current stage of their careers, Drew Holiday right now is a better defender than Marcus Smart. Yeah, I, I don't I don't think that's too much of a hot take. I thought Smart had a down season. Maybe he kind of refigures things out in Memphis. Who knows? But as far as you know, Based on what of, we've seen in the last right. year. Yeah. yeah. Supplementing so, that, he's good. Right. So so to be to bring it back to the original question, I think Drew helps them a lot. I think he makes them a much better team. I do still think, though, that probably their biggest issue as a team is offensively when they, they kind of just get stuck in a rut, right? Like you'll see, like, they kind of pass back and forth. It's all isolation, kind of, you know, breaking guys down off the dribble. 
I, I do think there's going to be moments where that still exists with Drew. I don't think he's a magic solve to those things. I mean, I, I think he's a good player and he makes them better, like I said. And obviously, defensively, he makes them wait. I mean, they clearly needed that. Derek White's a good point of attack defender, but I think they're going to be feel comfortable throwing Drew at a lot of wing players that they wouldn't like to throw Derek White at. Yeah. Um, but I, I think all, that, that I want to see the offense. Like, I'm, I'm really curious about this team because – it seemed like the whole thing with Missoula was shifting them from defense to offense, like Grant Williams role and, and just the way they played Robert Williams importance. And now he's not even there anymore. And now it's like you, you prioritize offense organizationally, but then you get Drew holiday. Who's the better defensive player. It's, those things can coexist, but I just really want to see like how they play, like what their focus is, how they use these big guys, like how much are they playing Al and Porzingis? How much are they just playing one of them? Um, I think it's going to be a fascinating year. I, I really, you know, there's talk about are the Bucks going to start slow because they're figuring things out and maybe, but I still think they're just good enough to win a bunch. I can't wait to see Boston because I think they're going to be, you know, maybe they're as different as Milwaukee, but Milwaukee's is like, okay, yeah, Dame and Chris do a bunch of actions and they're, you know, it's kind of obvious, right? Defensively, maybe it's more up in the air. Boston, I'm like, how are they going to play offensively? And I can't wait yeah. to see because I'm really curious, you know, how, how it comes together. I think there's so much talent. I don't think it's as clean of a fit offensively, even though there is a bunch of their top six is clearly, you know, one of, if not the best in the NBA. A lot of that is on Porzingis, in my opinion. Yeah. And, and I think throwing that domino in there as this three point shooting uh, rim protecting type of big man, it could solve some issues, but it also makes them double down on what they were last year, right? The Celtics last year in the playoffs, we saw it making a lot of threes. They're winning that game, missing a lot of threes. They are not winning that game. It's just that that's how easy it was. And if you're doubling down on that philosophy, we've seen teams in the past with, you know, the famous team is James Harden's Houston Rockets, but we've seen teams in the past where when you double down on jump shooting, being your ideology, your philosophy as an offense, it can come back to haunt you in the playoffs. That's where you need Drew Holiday's rim pressure. That's where you need Jason Tatum's rim pressure, Jalen Brown's rim pressure. And the onus is going to be on those guys even more to create and create and create. The drive and kick stuff was clear. That was their kind of the, the benchmark of what their offense was supposed to be set like. I think the defensive, um, the way they look defensively is a little bit more clear to me, to your point, than what they would look offensively. And I think throwing Porzingis in there, especially with his availability, the questions of health. I mean, people had those same questions about Robert Williams, but Porzingis, is he had a great healthy regular season last year, but there still is that question of, hey, can he continue to manufacture healthy seasons? Um, maybe they bring him along slow. Maybe they you know, start Al and, and kind of load manage in a lot of ways, if you will, when it comes to Porzingis. I don't know. And I think that's what, to your point, makes them really, really fascinating. They also have that depth issue where it's like, okay, after six, who are you relying on? Are you going to bring out O'Shea Brissett as a guy who can be a floor spacer for you, maybe big rebounder? They seem to like Delano Banton. I, I, as a, speaking from a Raptors perspective, good luck to you. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, and I, I'm just not sure when it comes from a depth perspective from them. I actually think I have more depth questions with them than I do with the the Bucks. And maybe maybe it's like marginal. Maybe the difference between the depth is is very, very slim, but I think I would give the advantage to Milwaukee. And when you're looking at this as sort of a playoff picture, and I know you're you're from a Bucks perspective, so obviously you might lean Milwaukee, but how do you think these two kind of pair up when it comes to a potential playoff series? Yeah, I, I lean Milwaukee. I mean I'm biased. I'm gonna admit it. I mean I try yeah. to be as little as possible. I try to not be, you know, um, like, you know, I don't know. I can't even think of an insane enough take of, you know, <laughs> Crowder's going to clamp the J nothing like that. I mean, it's not nothing ridiculous. I, I think it comes down to, you know, there's certainly the question of how you guard those wings is going to be big. And I think we're going to see a lot of like Crowder and Connaughton playing more than ever in that series, just to have more size. Obviously those guys, you're not saying, I'm not saying Pat Connaughton is who you want guarding <laughs> Jason Tatum. I'm saying, I think the Bucks will, will skew bigger. We'll probably see less Beasley out there and, and more of the bigger guys. And, and I think, you know, Milwaukee's defense as all, I mean, all defenses to a certain extent do, they're just betting more on that back line being awesome. And if, if you, if you can make a team, just be a jump shooting team over you, you probably have a good chance. I think that's what they're still betting on is see how much Brooke can play. And of course, Giannis on the back line there, maybe guarding primary more. I think we're going to see that. I think he is a back line defender is going to be more important than ever too. Yeah. But I think you look at how the NBA often not always works. 
And the Bucks in the East probably have the best two players in most series. You could argue Philly. You could argue Boston. I mean, I'm not saying definitively, but there's certainly a case. And I think they're fit. And and for all the, you know, how does, how does Milwaukee guard the Jays and, and Drew? How does anyone guard Dame and Giannis actions? Like it's, it's yeah. I, I think that's at least as big of a question, if not bigger. And the talent there is is just, I think, stacked in Milwaukee's favor, even if you want to say that Boston six is better than Milwaukee six. I like Milwaukee's two. I, I like Milwaukee's eight, if it matters. I, I agree with you. I think it's not decisively Milwaukee there, um, but I always bet on Giannis. And I think, I mean, this was a good seven game series with no Chris Middleton. That was different teams for these, both of these teams now. Yeah. Um, but uh, it was a really, it was a, r- a real close series. And I think if both teams are fully healthy and I hope they are, and I hope this is the conference finals. I, I don't want like when Milwaukee played Brooklyn in the second round, it sucks. And the, the next round is just weird after that against Atlanta. And then they went down. It's th- let this be the conference finals. Let everyone be healthy. Yeah. That's the series I want. I like Milwaukee's chances. I think it's a hard series. I'm not saying they easily win or they for sure win. Uh, but I like their, I don't bet against Giannis ever. So I'm, I'm always take the Bucks. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how much the regular season factors into this because home court advantage is going to be a big thing for this series yeah. too. Like who ends up first, who ends up second. Maybe they're both second and third, right? Yeah. Uh, and and maybe we can talk about some of these other teams in the Eastern Conference that are going to be chasing after the title. Is there any other team that kind of jumps out to you immediately that you need to mention? Maybe not in the same conversation as these two because I think they're in their own category. But anybody that might... I don't know, put the fear of God in you if you had to play them in, in a playoff series. I, I would say from the Bucks' perspective, I, I don't think there's fear of any team, but I think there's, I'll use the word apprehension. I mean, you have to mention Miami. I, I think their team is worse. I'm going to take their under probably at like 44 and a half or whatever because yeah. I think they lost good players. And they didn't add all that many to, to replace them. But in playoff settings, they just find ways. And I think like... I don't think these young guys are going to be like all all improve or you know most improved player nominees or anything like that. But they always find ways. I think they'll probably be aggressive around the deadline. Uh, they're always just really hard to play, and and they know how to win in the playoffs. So I'll mention them. Even I mean, that's something that sucks because that could be a first round series because they're probably right. going to have to scrap through the play in again. Yeah. Um, but you have to mention Miami. I think Cleveland. There's a bunch of questions. I mean, the way they went out was so bad. I do think though, like they, they just have a ton of talent. I almost think it's underrated now how much talent is on that Cavs team. I think Struess is probably as good as you could hope for, for a player to add in basically free agency for the hole they needed. They needed wings so badly. And I think he is yeah. a nice fit there. Um, you know, I still, again, is it fear? No, like, I, I don't think they, they're going to be able to beat Milwaukee or Boston. I, I think, you know, it'll be good for them if they can get some revenge on the Knicks, that should be their bar, but it's still like, they have a good team and they're probably the one who, if you're talking, could someone push Milwaukee and Boston out of one and two, I think they might grind out wins because that defense is going to be very good all regular season as it was last year. Yeah. Uh, and then Philly, I, I don't know, man. Make the third round. Make the third round once. We can't That's talk all about I ask. We, That's all I ask. There's just no way to even discuss Philly in any type of real yeah. scenario, just because of the James Harden situation. I, I every time I even sit down with myself to think about this stuff, I ignore Philly completely. Yeah. Because there's just there's no way around the James Harden conundrum, and you have no idea what this team is going to look like next week let alone the, the end of the yeah. year um i agree with you that it's it's the conversation is between cleveland and miami um i think miami obviously looks like a much more they're they're sort of two sides of a different coin here in the sense that miami you are scared of in the playoffs just because of what they can do in a postseason setting whereas cleveland is going to be a dominant regular season team i agree with you they could be that team you know that eastern conference team that we've always seen that wins the 60 games is uh the first seed they're like winning every single game they're gonna have four all-stars you know it could be that type of season for cleveland uh and i wouldn't be surprised by that whatsoever i would not be surprised if that happens the playoff questions are legitimate. I think some of their younger guys still have to take their bumps, so to speak, in the postseason. And that's where I think the separation is. Unless Mobley takes a most improved player type of leap, yeah. unless Garland is in a different stratosphere, then yeah, I, I think there's still things that they need to work on and kind of shake out in the postseason. 
uh, especially with JB Bakerstaff. I think that's a big question going into this season as well. Is like, hey, can he get them over that hump, or maybe they have to look at a new coach? I think it's a lot of pressure on him. Yeah, um, yeah. I think Mobley is the real swing. You know, I, I think they're trying to make Garland shoot. I don't know if Garland's ever going to be a guy who wants to shoot enough. I, I, not not saying anything negative about him. I think they could just use him to shoot more, and he just. It, it likes to be, you know, more of a, a facilitator at that right. point guard position. And he's great but yeah, 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 he is. He's a great player. Um, but I think if if Mobley, you know, I hate to always boil it down to shooting because people always did it with Giannis and it's annoying. But I think the way this team is built, their team and his backcourt or his front court mate in Jared Allen, I think it, even just like to the mid range, if he had a more reliable jumper, that changes a lot for their team. Yeah. Um, but I think that they have the biggest. I think upside outside of the the three that we've seen go to the conference finals over and over again um, to to be that team this year, um, but I, I would still definitely pick Milwaukee and Boston over them or anyone in, in a playoff series. Although I mean, again, Miami pushed Boston to seven and and beat Milwaukee this last year, and when, who knows? When it's Miami, I, I just I say this all the time, but like you literally you have to throw out any type of regular season data because this team is just completely different when it comes to the playoffs, especially Jimmy I, Butler, especially yeah. Man. Like those guys, they they operate on their own rules. Um, and yeah, I I mean, look, that's why the Eastern Conference title race is fascinating because yes, there are the two top dogs, and I think if you were to ask general consensus who are the top dogs in the entire NBA, they would probably say those two teams, Boston and Milwaukee, and then the rest, you know, Denver is obviously going to be in that conversation as well. Maybe Phoenix, maybe LA, but like for the most part, they're going to bring up Boston and Milwaukee as the two teams that should, for the most part, either make it to the NBA finals or Eastern conference finals. Um, Ty, I appreciate you coming on. Thank you so much for for talking Eastern Conference playoff race. This is sort of a, a contenders only conversation. We'll talk about the second half of that uh, playoff race at some point in time later. At some point, we got to bring down bring you up to to talk Damon Giannis when we see yeah. them for more games. Um, but yes, thank you, Ty. Anything you want to plug before we get out of here? Thank you so much for having me first. Would love to do that literally whenever. Um, cool. Can't wait to see Damianis and Chris. That's the night we have so much to look forward to. That's the nice part, I guess, about the, the injuries. But gspn.info to find the Eurostep, uh, all of our Bucks content, our Discord, and we have uh, Milwaukee Brewers, Green Bay Packers podcast as well. So a bunch of stuff you can find there. Uh, my social should be in there somewhere too, but just Ty Windish everywhere. But make sure, you know, if you, before you even do that, if you haven't yet rated and reviewed this podcast, do that first. Then you can go. You know, Respects. check out mine if you want to, but you got to do this one because you just listen to a whole episode. That's that means something in today's yeah. day and age. Hell yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Ty. Thank you very much. See you later. See you, man. Joining me for the Western Conference, you know, sort of title race here, Raj Chapalu. He is of uh, Lakers access, all access Lakers, excuse me, at Lakers detailed uh he's on your airways wherever you are you can find him on spaces you can find him on playback tv i always see you doing something when it comes to live stuff yeah. so i commend you good sir because i could never i can't get into the live <laughs> sphere i don't know what it is but mm -hmm. uh it, it's it's awesome to see you doing your thing my guy uh and it's awesome to see the lakers also doing their thing as well it's, yeah it, it's funny because like when you go through the offseason, you see the offseason that the Lakers had and you say, OK, well, on paper, this looks like a really phenomenal team. And then when you see it in person, not in person, but like see it live in game, it's a little bit different because now you have just sort of an idea of how it's going to look on the court. Um, right. And I guess the main takeaway I've had from early watching these Lakers is they are big, like th yeah. they have a lot of size. Um, what, what has kind of jumped out to you about the Lakers sort of early in the preseason here? So it's funny. I remember coming on your show in February and we were talking after they came back from like a 27 point deficit against the Mavs. Yeah. And if you go listen to that show, it sounds like we're talking about a four seed and they were like 13th at the time. And I remember saying, <laughs> I'm not, sh I'm not sure what this season is going to you know produce, but you could tell the pieces fit. Opening yeah. night last year, S, these are the three guys we started next to LeBron and AD. Russell Westbrook, Patrick Beverly, and Lonnie Walker. Now, whoever those, whoever you think is the small forward in that, doesn't matter, right? The tallest guy in there is 6'4", <laughs> and it's not a big 6'4". It's like 6'4 in shoes. You know what I mean? Like, it, yeah, yeah. It, they don't, there's not much size there. Last night, there was no LeBron James, and they had a lineup. And this is against the Milwaukee Bucks in preseason, of course. But Milwaukee's huge. I mean, even though you throw Damon for Drew... You have Giannis, Brooke Lopez, Bobby Portis, right? It's just a lot of arms everywhere. Yep. The Lakers still look 
big on their end. They had Rui, AD, and Christian Wood out there. And that's just a lot of size to be able to put out. And I think that's, to me, the main difference. The shortest guy really on this team is Gabe Vincent. I think he's like 6'4", 6'3". Other than that, everyone else is pretty big for their size. D'Lo's a big guard. And if they're not big, they're at least physical, right? So Austin Reeves is a super physical guard. Gabe Vincent is, right. well, is a guy who can who plays really physical. And Torian Prince has fit in great with the starters to the where to where I think he's going to start. And to me, that's the main difference. You look around and there's just a bunch of size everywhere where AD doesn't have to do the physical battle every night or where he can have Jackson Hayes and Christian Wood take on some of that burden to where now he's bringing the ball up and you see the crossovers come in. So I agree with you. The size for sure um, stands out with the team. So it's interesting because when you have that size and you mentioned some of the backcourt players as well, I think versatility is another thing that pops up with this Lakers team, not Mm. just versatility and just like scheme what you're able to throw out there, but just lineups, right? You can go bigger with a go throw Jackson Hayes and Anthony Davis together or throw Christian Wood and and Anthony Davis together, or you could go smaller, have one of those guys be your five, maybe space Mm -hmm. the floor a little bit more with Gabe D'Lo and Austin on the court together. Like there's, you have this fluidity that they Mm -hmm. didn't really have last year. Um, And we're speaking about a team that after the trade deadline was on pace for a 50 win type season, they were, you know, obviously without LeBron James in that stretch, clawed their way to the Western Conference Finals in the playoffs. Like this is this is a team that was really, really good in the second half. Yeah. And then on top of that, refine that team to be even better. So when you when you kind of stack them up into the rest of the West, you know, there's obviously the injury questions with AD LeBron. There's obviously that. But I think they're much more insulated now than they ever were to deal with those injuries. Do you Uh-oh. think that's true? Hundred percent. We have a deep roster. I think you know you can put the Lakers roster up against anyone, and that's really what happens, right? With the issue with the Russell Westbrook situation, and Russ had his flaws as a basketball player, but mostly what it was was his contract kind of ate up a ton of space. Where now you can kind of divide that into a ton of different places. The Lakers were doing this thing as for a long time, where they were just chasing free agents, so they were just kicking this can down the road, right? And they were signing all these minimum contract players, and you're gonna hit on a few. But, like, you do that, and eventually you're not going to hit on a ton, right? And so what they did, Rob Palinka called it pre-agency last trade deadline. And that's basically what happened, right? We traded for Rui Hachimura, got D'Angelo Russell, got Jared Vanderbilt. And all those dudes extended this summer, along with Austin Reeves, who obviously showed out. Austin, yeah. by the way, who they're talking about maybe – Maybe all like maybe he won't be an all star, but that type. But of, he could be in that conversation. Yeah, I hear you. He's yeah. he's gonna get the votes for number one. Yeah, like that. That's what's gonna happen. And the strangest thing as to me is watching a Laker team that not only gets threes but hunts them. It's 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 mm-hmm. extremely different. Uh, it, it's extremely year. different than what yeah. it's been. Yeah, no, but even in the the year that they won the title, right? It was a lot of this like AD and LeBron have to kind of bully their way to the paint, collapse the defense. Mm-hmm. And then kick it out where the three pointer is kind of the last result, right? That's kind of okay. You stopped AD and LeBron. Let's kick out to these shooters, KCP, right. Kyle Kuzma. This is a totally different team. This is a no, D Lo, you go under the screen, I'm firing from three, right? Austin Reeves, you come off a pick and roll, like you go under, I'm firing. Um, Gabe Vincent, another guy who's going to shoot. Torian Prince, one of my favorite things about him is he's a guy that doesn't need to be wide open to shoot. And that was kind mm-hmm. of some of the issues, right? To where like, AD would set him a little flare screen, and Steph is just a tad bit off. He's like, no, this is my shot. And he came out publicly and said, I'm going to shoot 40% from three, kind of declaring it because he like knows it. the type. I think, number one, you love the confidence. And number two, he just, I think, realized the type of shots he's going to get um, around right. these guys. But to me, that's such a vast difference in what we've been to where there's been like, I think LeBron's played in around two of the preseason games. Mm-hmm. As it's so little on ball, LeBron, like it's a ton of him working off the ball. And of course, in late in games, he's going to have the basketball, but it's him cutting or him back cutting. Lakers are getting back cuts. Like they would never get back cuts. Team would seem yeah. to just pack the paint on them. And there was nowhere to go dribble handoff action. And I just love how Darvin Ham has switched to this five out offense. And it's creating all these driving lanes to where, you know, you don't want LeBron to have the burden for an 82 game regular season to beat his man off the dribble. You move him to a screener, you get him downhill without having to do that. Right. And that really takes the pressure off him. And then those bigs that we talked about takes the pressure off AD. This just feels like a really deep team. And the thing that continuity gives you is you're allowed to be on your third and fourth progressions of your plays 
without starting from scratch, right? They played the Bucks last night, and they're on their first. They're just stepping on their ladder, and the Lakers have a chance to start on, like, their third or fourth step, which is really nice yeah. when in the past they've been just resetting the roster every year, hoping, you know, that a Kendrick Nunn, a Trevor Ariza, a Carmelo Anthony, guys who I don't think are in the league right now, but, like, you know, those <laughs> all those guys hit, um, and, and this is a much, you know, more better formula for success for sure. Yeah. It's funny. You mentioned Rob Palinka. He mentioned continuity, like as a mm-hmm. big thing, they were kind of focused on this season. Uh, and that's obvious in their approach as they have this team right now, LeBron, I think uh, there's this, there's this sort of like behind the scenes conversation. Nobody is mentioning it. There's this like subconscious thought of him entering year 21. Yeah. Obviously he has the mileage on his body. Obviously there's the age questions. No one, not one person that has played this long, has been this productive ever, right? Mm-hmm. And that that's a testament to his greatness, his goatness, whatever you want to call it. But ultimately, I think there is that question. But then the other side of that is this team is probably most prepared to deal with that, whatever yeah. that outcome might be. Um, and I don't think you need the the LeBron James of old to be able to manufacture a really, really good basketball team out of this. But But where do you stand on like, what, I guess what your expectations are of LeBron, yeah. maybe even of AD, you know, when it comes to this season and how that might look this year. Yeah, the expectations are probably unfair, right, for a guy going into yeah. year 21. But that's kind of where the team is. Like if LeBron can't, and I thought he did a fantastic job. I think he hurt his, you know, he hurt his ankle in the in the Mavs game that we were just discussing to prior. And yeah. he, he talked about how that, you know, that hurt him as the playoffs went on. But, I mean, you look at the our, the Lakers' final game. I believe he played all 48 minutes. I think he dropped 50 or 48 on, on Denver. Um, absolutely unstoppable still. And the point to me is to get him there, right, is to try to get him to that point. And I think the Lakers have built a team as good as you can, right? Like, LeBron's not 35. Uh, he's 30, 38, I believe now. Um, yeah. And, and so like that, that, that mileage is definitely there, but he looks like he's still rejuvenated. Like he's got a team around him that I think he understands has a chance, right? Like it has an opportunity to win and he can look around at the roster. LeBron's a smart guy. I mean, I'm sure he goes into every season thinking he has a chance, but I'm sure like last season when that started, there was some of this like, well, you know, how much should I really put into the season? And after the trade went down and he looked around and said, look, I can I can make a run with this team. And they definitely did. Um, and I think for Anthony Davis, every year, you know, it feels like as Anthony Davis's last name is if he's healthy. Because if you hear anyone talk about him, it goes, Anthony Davis, if he's if Anthony Davis, yeah. if he's healthy. Right. And I, I get that. I totally understand that. When that dude plays, he's a monster. He was the best defensive yeah. player in the league last year. That GM survey came out. I think didn't even have him. Uh, mentioned or had him that, on like the GM honorary survey is ridiculous. It was honorary, yeah. honorary mentioned, but you know he went to the playoffs and I thought he was destructive. He uh, extremely yep. tore down a Warriors offense. Say what you will about Clay and them. Go listen to Steve Kerr talk about it. Absolutely changed the way they had to play um, against Memphis as well in the first round. Denver did a you know Denver was the best team in the league, but Anthony Davis just looks awesome. This looks like the best shape he's been in to start a season. He talked about wanting to be in shape when the season starts. That's a new thing for him. He looks in shape, doesn't look like he has to get into any type of any type of midseason form. The jump shot's been there. We'll see if that's real. But I think this is a team that has a is better equipped to also take the burden off him a little bit too. The jokes mm-hmm. always come, right? As of Anthony Davis quotes come out every year. I don't want to play center. And that gets laughed out loud by all the goats and all the people on Twitter. <laughs> We're not in the games, right? You know what I mean? Like, so I, I, I don't, I want to at least listen to the guy that has to take the bumps and bruises. And I think from his yeah. perspective, it's like, look, I don't want to have to battle Jonas Valanciunas in a February game. Like, you know, like right. that type of stuff I'm sure wears on him. So it's nice to have a, as, as w- whatever you think of Christian Wood, like just be that first wall, right? Be that physical wall to where I can come over and be the help defender. Rui took that. Um, took that mantle as well in the playoffs. Jackson Hayes, another guy that they're looking at as, hey, just go run and dunk and be, you know, super uber athletic around the rim. He is and ridiculous think- around the rim. Oh my god, he can jump uh, out the gym. I didn't realize this uh, because he kind of fell out of the rotation in yeah. New Orleans, but he he can jump out of the gym, man. Oh, absolutely. And I think his pick and roll game is going to be awesome next to our guards. We flipped S from this like really sluggish offense where it was post up LeBron on one side, post up AD on one side, hopefully, you know, create a mismatch there. It's turned into just in a modern offense, really. It's become modernized where like it's pick and roll basketball 
to where it's Austin, D'Lo, you know, LeBron, whoever running ball screens. And I think that really just, it's a team built around Anthony Davis's offensive skills, which is Mm -hmm. really different than what it's been, right? A LeBron team, a lot of the times has been a bunch of Kyle Corvers, J.R. Smiths, right? And that's not really this team. It's, we have a bunch of playmakers off of LeBron that allows him to kind of work his way through a season. And hopefully AD also has some of that burden taken off him as well. So we'll see. They're saying MVP season for him. I'm just want him to play, you know, the requisite 65 to 75 <laughs> games, and I'll I'll be happy with that. Go get his defensive player of the year award that he should have won see, last year. I, I was gonna say I think I think that's more up for grabs for him, uh is, yeah. is being that defensive player of the year. And you mentioned like, you know, playing the, those double big lineups of Christian or Jackson. I think in a lot of ways, when you look at the Warrior series, they and mm-hmm. even a little bit the Nuggets series, maximizing him defensively uh, yeah. was him as a rover, right? Yes, yep. you could play drop with him. You could have him at the level. You can have him switch out. These are all the versatile things that Anthony Davis can do defensively. But his mm-hmm. length is obviously so much more impactful when you have him as a rover on the weak side, when he's just going to clean up literally anything that you want to do. Um, that's the potential for a player like that. And like when he taps into that best in the league, like without, without question, the best weak side rim protector, whatever you want to call it, uh, yeah. basketball has to offer. And um, to, to your point yeah, real no, quick on, to your point with that, the biggest adjustment in the Warriors series was we put him in on Wiggins. So then yeah. we put, you know, Vando on Draymond so that you could switch to Steph Draymond pick and yeah. roll. And then to involve Wiggins in it, he's not as dynamic of a roller, right? So, like, to me, that was the biggest adjustment there that allowed AD to be off ball, as you talked about. And yeah, I think this team has a chance to play into that. Have You have Rui, LeBron, you know, and then hopefully Wood take those physical battles where that's where makes AD, that's what makes AD special. He can be a pterodactyl, right? He can have hands. He can right. close out to the corner while also taking away the rim. That's just special stuff that, like, only a handful of guys in the league can do. And I think that's what you need when you have to go up against, you know, we'll get into it, but like the Devin Bookers, the Kevin Durant's, the, you know, Steph right. Curry's of the world. Um, and Anthony Davis is one of those guys that, that gives you a chance in those series. Darvin Ham, good coach, man. He's a good coach. Like, I, I, I really think like some of the adjustments he showed off, uh, not only in the in the Warriors and Nuggets series, but even earlier in the playoffs against the Grizzlies, just defensively, some of the things that he did to to make things uncomfortable for them. Mm-hmm. Uh, really, really good coach. Um, okay, so, so so since we're on the conversation of how they stack up, right? The Lakers, I think, when you look at the rest of the Western Conference title mm-hmm. picture, it, there's obviously Denver, there's Phoenix, there's Golden State. If you want to throw them in there, some people will bring in the Clippers, although I'm not necessarily there anymore, just because sure. of health and and everything else. Uh, I mean, to be fair, fully healthy, that is a really, really fun and interesting team that could potentially win a title, but we just haven't seen it ever. Yeah. So so we, I can't put them in the conversation. I feel like it starts with Denver, though, and sort of to bring up the, the start of our conversation about the Lakers' size, I think that was a big issue they wanted to sort of address. Yes, they were big last year, but now they're bigger, and maybe there's that opportunity of, okay, this, this we like our – matchup against Denver, maybe even 5% more, whatever yeah. percentage that is. How do you think this team stacks up against Denver, who is the re- re- defending champs, mm-hmm. has lost a little bit of depth? You guys, like we mentioned, are probably one of the more deeper teams in the league. Where where do you see them stacking up against Denver? Yeah, so this I don't like to say this because it just doesn't sound, you know, good. But like those games were close. I mean, it's not fair, you know what I mean? It was a, <laughs> it was a sweep, but you know, it just comes off wrong from a person covering the Lakers saying, "Oh yeah, but it was a close sweep." Like I don't want to hear that <laughs> on the other side either. Um, but if you dive into those games, S, and I think the big thing that happened was obviously Jaron Vanderbilt couldn't shoot, Dennis Schroeder, all those guys who had trouble. But to me, it was a D'Angelo Russell was kind of the X factor there right they were able to not guard him and I think that made life really tough on both LeBron and AD as well Mm because he's one of your better shooters and they took him out of the series and he's talked about this a ton and I think D'Angelo kind of represents the whole team's mindset really in terms of they physically outmatched us and their continuity beat us right those two things really killed them you talk you talk to anyone on the team what was Denver's advantage? Their continuity, right? When they get into their fourth and fifth progressions, they've run those actions thousands of times, right? They know what the read is before you even make the defense rotation. It's that's, like a well-oiled machine. It's like, it's like 100%. you're playing against AI, essentially, right? Yep. Yeah, their DHOs, their rip actions, like th- that stuff, like it's very tough to cover to where you on the other side also need to have 
defended that action thousands of times, right? To know, okay, where is he going on this play? And I think that's something that we have a lot better chance at this season of going against mm-hmm. them. And look, there's no, there's no answer for Nikola Jokic. Like that, he's back two time MVP. Like that, there's no answer there. I do think we have, yeah. we're better equipped to at least slow him down, right? That's all you can do with a player like that. Jamal Murray, you know, Jokic got a lot of the acclaim. I remember watching all those games live and rewatching those games. Jamal Murray was absolutely. He was hitting absurd. shots, man. Man, incredible shots. Yeah, hitting hitting shots and shots that I think were defended well. Honestly, there was mm-hmm. a lot of step back threes. There was a lot of stuff where he went nuts. And I think like now the Lakers at least hopefully can have a couple different other pieces to at least put on him to where it makes life a little bit tougher. Um, you're never gonna stop that duo. And I think Bruce Brown losing Bruce Brown is a you know, huge kind of loss for them. Obviously, he went to Indiana. They're gonna, they're hoping for their rookies to step up as well. Um, so we'll see, we'll see how that goes. But they're gonna be another, you know, powerhouse. We'll see if they want to run through the regular season again. But I think that was, that is a pretty close matchup of two teams that I think are both betting on continuity as well, right? Denver's betting on their stars. Yeah. The Lakers are like, we got our guys through a conference finals. Um, and a lot of words back and forth between the teams, which is nice and <laughs> fun. And, you know, Mike Malone shooting his little shots here and there. I, I like it. I like it. I like, you know, yeah. it doesn't need to be a friendly matchup at all. We'll be there on ring night. <laughs> uh, hopefully I was going to say opening one. night, the, the drama is, is perfect for opening 100%. night. You're watching them. You're watching them take the rings that, you know, potentially could have been yours. Yeah. Uh, I, I think like when it comes to that Denver series, I was really looking forward to a potential because it was close there of a Denver Boston series just to Mm. see how they matched up against them because they had the size necessary compared to Miami who had Bam out of bio. You think about Boston, they could throw out Al Horford. You have Robert Williams as a weak side guy, right? They had the size potentially. Grant Williams has always, for some reason, been a good Jokic defender. And I'm wondering if maybe the Lakers can sort of take that science and apply it to what Denver was. Whereas, hey, we can throw, I, it won't work well, but let's throw Jackson Hayes as our primary on Nikola Jokic and let's have Anthony Davis be the help off of it. Okay. Yeah. You know, let's try the Rui Hachimura thing, but maybe we're a little bit more adept on the perimeter at the point of attack to be able to you know, clean up those rotations. Like this is the, this is the kind of game you have to play with yourself to not only sell yourself on the idea of, Hey, we can beat this team in any given series, but like we we're also more equipped to do that this year. Do you think that is true? Do you think that looking at it, they are better equipped this season than they were, you know, five months ago to potentially beat this team? I, I definitely do. And I'm going to throw another guy into this. And it, Mike Malone laughed off the Rui Hachimura adjustment in game one. Right? He's like, oh, that, you know, that was an amazing adjustment kind of being uh, just laughing about it. But I do think like yeah. the way to beat, beat Denver is like Jokic, you're not going to stop him and you can't double him. Right. That's like the two sins. You double Jokic, you're dead. And they yeah. do a great job ducking guys in with Aaron Gordon. Um, Aaron Gordon killed us as well. He was able to duck in on like Dennis Schroeder or D'Angelo Russell. Um, and he'll probably do similar things to Gabe Vincent and things like that. Um, but I think like you need to be able to make their guys play two on two. Uh, like you need to at least keep that like Jokic Murray in like a two on two place where you're not giving up wide open shots to the shooters. And number two, Austin Reeves is in a totally different role than he was like last year. Like last year, I think he was still trying to come up and he had a great series against Denver. I think he averaged like 18 a game in that series. Um, but moving him to now more of an on-ball threat, it just it just puts another guy where you have to throw a real defender at and kind of takes a little bit more of the pressure off of LeBron and AD. I think AD had like 40 in game one, right? And then they were able to really just um, collapse on him, and he struggled offensively through the rest of that series. Mm-hmm. Like he was, he was not good enough, in my opinion. But I also thought like the Lakers ran out of gas. We talked about how they were playing playoff games in February, and I think we have a season now where they can at least – Denver didn't even try the last month, right? Almost right. To, to the point where Jokic lost the MVP to Embiid because, like, he just yeah. he, they were just not engaged. And I think the Lakers have a chance to do that. They built a deep team that should be able to really stack up wins as in the regular season, and then give yourself a little bit of this um, area to where you can rest your guys down the stretch, where you don't have to be full board, where you don't have to play LeBron forty eight minutes in a game in the end of February because you're eight games back of the play in, right? Like that's. That stuff yeah. really adds up when you get into higher and higher levels of basketball. The details matter. The intricate details really come into play. And Denver having the legs when we didn't, like that's a huge matchup, especially like a late fourth quarter. Your legs are dead, and Denver just has that extra boost to go. Like that, that's stuff to me that really can close the margins. Um, but well, they're still the especially team. Especially just because, 
you have LeBron James and Anthony yeah. Davis and the mileage on their bodies, right? Like that's yep. that's a factor you have to consider. A February night versus I don't know Orlando or whatever. I, right. I don't know. I'm just saying, like you need to. Although Orlando is going to be a might good be team, tough. Yeah, yeah, they might <laughs> they might be tough. No, no question. But like you know what I mean. They're, this is sure. you can at least pace yourself a little bit more in the regular season. You're not working from behind, as you were right. kind of saying. Uh, yeah, that is definitely going to help these Lakers. And I think the 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 difference between the Nuggets and how it might work in a playoff series, that's going to be an interesting wrinkle. I would still say just because Jokic is on the team, just because Murray is potentially looking to take a step back, sure. that they're the top dogs in the West, right? They, Absolutely. They're the defending champs. You got to give them the respect of that. But then there are other teams out there. We mentioned Phoenix and Golden State. We can yeah. talk about Phoenix first. Uh, how they potentially match up. I, I just have a lot of questions about Phoenix and what this team might look like. They're going to dominate in the regular season just because they're going to be one of the best offenses in the league. A lot of their guys outside of Kevin Durant, Bradley Beal, Devin Booker are plug and play. They're going to score tons and it's sure. not going to matter in the regular season, right? They're going to be able to do their thing. Even if, even if like Kevin Durant, like he has for the last few seasons, misses 20 so games, they're still yeah. going to win a lot, right? Sure. The question comes in the playoffs when you're looking at Yusuf Nurkic, who has lost the step as their anchor. Yeah. Um, you're looking at a point of attack defense that has Bradley Beal and Devin Booker, and maybe there's a, a, a Keita Bates Diop or a Eric Gordon or a Utah Watanabe. And it's like, it, yes, it, you could see a world where that works, but right. then there's still so many more questions than there are for the Nuggets, than there are for the Lakers, in my opinion. How do you think they stack up to the rest of the West and what they look like? It's funny. You said Nurkic lost a step. I'm not sure he had a step. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like <laughs> Nurkic was already already playing behind. I didn't like that move for them. I think it looks cleaner offensively than I thought it would. I just, like, to me, Aiden's Nurkic swap, that talent gap for where they are in their careers and to where what you need. Frank Vogel, to me, is like a big man whisperer, so I'm surprised that, like, they just – quit yeah. on that that experiment but yeah phoenix is interesting kevin durant devin booker bradley beal are going to score a ton of points they, they just will my question for them as in and you i think you put it clearly that they're going to win a bunch of regular season games i just have trouble a team that's this jump shot heavy that doesn't pressure the rim you know like their rim yeah. pressure to me and it's understandable right when you're that good of a mid-range shooter why go to the rim right from their perspective right. they're like why should i go and jump into this big man when I can just take this 15 footer, 15 footer that I shoot at 50%. You know what I mean? But like to me in the playoffs, when possessions matter, where every possession is so detailed and, and so constructive to winning, like I have trouble seeing a team that just lives and dies by their jump shooting. And I think they won two games off of Denver because Devin Booker didn't miss for two games. And he can do that. Yeah. He can definitely do that. Can he do that for four rounds? I have trouble seeing that. And then they're in a very similar case to me where the Lakers were in 2021 and i'm not comparing beal to russ in this situation it's just i think they don't have enough guys who do the dirty work you know what i mean like a beal book and kd they're just not built that way nor, nor should they be those they've been stars in the league but you need players that like okay i'm gonna go defend this guy for 30 minutes and be the lockdown defender or i'm gonna go do the hustle stuff i'm gonna go offensive rebound like that's to me the stuff that they're missing and they're doing, again, they're going right. to try and hit all, a lot of the minimum signings. I like Yuta Watanabe. Um, I like their backup center as well that they got from Portland. Uh, Eubanks, I believe. Like, I like him as well. But yeah. I think that's a lot of guys you have to bet on. Um, and then, obviously, the health as well of KD, Beal. Um, we'll see how, how many games they play. But that's my worry with them. They're jump shooting. The Lakers, I think, have a really good chance to where, like, if you're going to take away the rim from a team, I feel like it's very hard to win. And Anthony Davis, I think, does an incredible job of that, and that's where I wonder with them. But you always have to, you have to, you always have to be scared, man. Book, KD, and Beal can just go nuts in a series, and you lose. Like that's 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 definitely a possibility. Right. Frank Vogel coaching them is just so hilarious to me as a guy who's watched <laughs> Frank Vogel for you know a few years and what he values and what he you know stands for, and this team kind of is against all of that, <laughs> you know. Like he's right. he's all into defense and winning you know in slug out and slug out battles and Rim you know i'm gonna play to get into the basket yes yeah, yeah. i'm gonna play two bigs and you know we're gonna keep you in mud and the suns are against all that it's five out we're spacing we're gonna shoot a ton it's gonna be yeah. a high scoring game and, and i'll be interested to see what they do I think the underrated thing about not being able to get to the rim is that it sort of changes the geometry of the court for you because yeah. 
team teams are okay with just uh, taking that away for you. You have the mid range, you have the three point shot. And to a certain extent that applied to the Boston Celtics last year, because mm-hmm. they were just three point reliant consistently. They weren't able to get to the rim a ton. And they're sort of funny enough. They're doubling down on that philosophy with guys like Kristaps Porzingis. Now yeah. uh, we'll see how that looks. We, we already did the preview with the Celtics, but ultimately the, that's some of the same concerns I have with Phoenix of how is this going to look yeah. when the going gets tough, when the threes are not falling, when you Utah Watanabe is not hitting 70% on corner threes, <laughs> when Eric Gordon has the night where he just isn't hitting anything, he's two of 12, you know what I mean? There will be those types of nights. How are they going to coincide with that? I That's my biggest question. It seems like a team that uh, at the deadline might decide to make some kind of move. Uh, yeah. Now, to be fair, it's not like they have tons of flexibility to be able to do that. Uh, I think the Grayson Allen signing is actually a really good signing. I think he fits well. You know, like you said, a guy who can do some of the dirty work, he's sort of made his money off of doing the dirty work in the league. So maybe maybe him, maybe a guy like Josh Okogie can scrape it up together and be that type of dude. Still tons of questions, though, for the Suns team. And I think with the Warriors, it's a little bit different of a story. We can sort of talk about them if you want to. Sure. Uh, how do you think they stack up to the to the three that we mentioned? Are they a far fourth, or are they deservingly in the conversation here I, with these I, guys? I still think they're in the conversation just because Steph, Clay, and Draymond to me, and obviously Clay's extension is like the large talking point for them. But to me, like you still have Steph, Clay, and Draymond. Like that gives you to me as a baseline to where you're going to be at some mm-hmm. baseline level of competitiveness. Um, and that series again was, I think, closer than people remember. It went six, but there was a lot of it did. game yeah. one. Yeah, game one was really tight. They almost stole that one. Um, and you know, all, anytime Steph Curry just breaks basketball still in ways that you know is hard to really define. And I think he has enough of a talent pool there. Jonathan Kaminga looks great. Looks like the athlete that they needed. I'm kind of glad he didn't play a lot <laughs> in that series. Steve Kerr was a uh, <laughs> very tight on the rotation with him. And I always thought that he did great because he just gives off an athletic. He puts them in an athletic stratosphere that they just don't get to without him. Yeah. You know, a lot of their basketball is very much in this, just trying to create these open threes for, for Steph and clay running off screens. Kaminga breaks you by beating you. He's a 1% athlete. And then obviously the Chris Paul conundrum to me is, is fascinating. I just, I have no idea what that is. Draymond's obviously out for the first month. It looks fine. I mean, Chris Paul is enough of a playmaker to he'll be smart with it, and he's going to get his shots. I just wonder if he's on the team in March. Like, I wonder if they try to flip him for someone that's obviously, and his last name also feels like a great contract to be traded. You know, you talk about Chris Paul, it just dives right into his contract. But they're an interesting bunch, and I think they have players now that are more suited to kind of be surrounded, right? No more Jordan Poole, so you don't have to worry about his shot selection in games. Uh, they're trying to go for more defensive, heavy players, playing more Kaminga. I love their rook, rookie, Pajemski. I think he's awesome. I think he's a rookie, like a, ro- a straight-up Warriors rookie. He just has a ton of feel. Um, mm-hmm. But it's also around Steph, who just looks incredible. I He was he played the preseason game a few games ago, and that dude just looks like he has not missed a beat. Just He was incredible last year. They won the title two years ago. And that's a guy you got to fear as in a playoff series. Yeah. It just is. He breaks oh, you. Yeah, in, yeah. Um, Lakers made him a little bit more of a ball handler, but he was still incredible at that. Like he still, uh, he still takes you out of games and and breaks your um, defensive playbook. So we'll see with them. I have them like right in that tier. I don't think there's a large gap though between them and like Phoenix. Like I just feel like those two are like pretty aligned in terms of where they are in the West and uh, right. their team also that I'm interested to see how they play out the regular season, how aggressive they go into it. Right. We'll see if they kind of accept the play in as a means to an end kind of just get in and you know hope our guys are healthy or if they really go full bore and try to attack the regular season so a lot of teams in that boat but i put them right there with phoenix as well yeah it's funny you mentioned the the well-oiled system right the warrior system is just I yeah mean, everybody knows it so well i think they have that similar connection to denver in the sense that they have that second and third and fourth action just ready yep. to go if the first thing doesn't happen right um, and ultimately that's going to be key, right? How this works together. You have tons of experience now on this roster. You add a guy like Dario Saric, who can kind yeah. of be this plug and play type of guy. Chris Paul, like you mentioned, obviously has tons of experience playing like that as well. Maybe he, maybe his style is kind of a curveball compared to what they usually do, but Hey, maybe a curveball is what they need 
to yeah. get this team to that next level. Who knows? Uh, I agree with you. I think they are in this conversation. I would I would put them in the Phoenix range as well, just because of some age factors, right? They're a little bit older, sort of mm-hmm. like the Lakers. They're, they're relying on some older pieces as well off the bench. If you can get through a regular season mm-hmm. and you know, you're know you in the playoffs with a 9-10 man rotation of, of this type of depth that they have, then you're talking. Then you're then yeah. you're at a position where you're like, okay, let's see what happens in any given series with any of these teams, and we like our chances just because we have Steph Curry, right? Yep. Um, and that's that's what it comes down to for the Warriors. Raj, anything you want to plug? Anything you got going on before we head out of here? Nah, man, this was this was awesome. I'm glad to be back again. Hopefully, I can come back again when the Lakers are some top seed, you know, and we can yes, kind of discuss yeah. that. Discuss that. But uh, yeah, no, you can follow me on Twitter at Raj Chipalu. I you know post up clips. Um, I'm trying to get on the Cam Reddish train as a lot of people are asking me to board. <laughs> um, haven't got on yet. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm watching the train go by and, I, you know, I like it. I'm just, I haven't, I haven't hopped yeah, on fully. Yeah. Um, but yeah, at Raj Chapali, we do the live games on playback as well. Um, me and, you know, Vinay do the Lakers detail podcast as well that uh, we dive into, yep. you know, game film and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, man, should be an exciting and a fun season coming up here. If you guys want Lakers content, follow Raj. He is consistently keeping you informed on all things Lakers, whether it comes to the film breakdown stuff or large picture stuff. He does a great job of it. Raj, I appreciate you, my guy. Thank you very much. Thank you to everybody who has tapped into the Objective Basketball Podcast. Do the liking, the reviewing that you guys usually do, and we will see you guys later. Thank you. Follow hosts at Just S. Barahini on all socials and at the Lauren Gun on Twitter. The Objective Basketball Podcast. Delivering the NBA to you like no other.